Hey guys, in this video, I'm gonna share our exact A-B testing strategy. Now, if you're watching this video, you likely already know that A-B testing and marketing is absolutely crucial. But most brands and even most agencies don't A-B test. And most who do, don't actually have a framework or a strategy behind their testing. We do. And it's this framework that's helped us improve opt-in rates for one of our clients from 1% to 4.85% and continuing to grow. And it's the same framework that has helped us generate 75% more revenue from an already successful welcome series for another client. So I'm gonna dive in and share our strategies for A-B testing flows, campaigns, and pop-ups in this video. So let's dive in. Okay guys, so as promised, this is the exact SOP that we use inside of our agency. Uh, and whenever we start split testing, we always wanna start with the step that's actually gonna have highest leverage. So highest leverage here just means that changing that one thing will have the biggest impact on the rest of the system. It's not good enough to just split test to split test. It's important to understand why you're split testing and what your goal is from the split test as well. And the first thing that we wanna test and optimize almost 100% of the time is gonna be the pop-up, simply because the more people that we get into our system, the more people we get to opt in through the pop-up, the more people we get into our email ecosystem, meaning more people in flows, more people in campaigns. Now, before we dive into the exact split tests that we use and how to split test the pop-up, the flows and the campaigns, it's really important to understand that there's two different types of split tests that we can do, and there's beneficial times for each one of those split tests. So the two types of split testing is sequential testing and the simultaneous testing. So sequential testing is basically just testing two different variables, one after another in, in a sequence. For example, you run a pop-up with a 10% offer from April 1st to 15th, and then you run a pop-up with a free shipping offer from April 16th to 30th. As sometimes with campaigns, for example, you may actually need to do sequential testing versus simultaneous testing, but with sequential testing, you have two different time windows, meaning you have other variables that are outside of your control that could actually impact the results of your split test. Now, if you had a promotion one week, for example, um, but not in the other, or if you're selling bathing suits in Vancouver and the weather heated up from the 16th to the 30th, different results could kind of transpire from there, right? Again, whenever you're split testing, the goal is to eliminate the variables or to limit the variables at least that could impact the results of your split testing. So sequential testing might look like this. So you, again, we ran a split test or we ran a, uh, a test until April 24th on one pop-up. And then we had another one that started right after that. Now, simultaneous testing, on the other hand, is just a little bit different in that it occurs at the same time. Personally, I like to limit variables as much as humanly possible. So whenever it is possible to do simultaneous split tests like this, I prefer to do that. With simultaneous split testing, the traffic will be split between two different variables or maybe three or four, depending on what you're testing. So assuming you run the test long enough and collect enough data points, you've eliminated one of those variables that could kind of just like fuck with the results that you're getting, right? Now, this is an example of a simultaneous split test. So we're doing a simultaneous pop-up split test here. And you can see, okay, we're testing an original design versus a new design. Um, and this has been running, you know, from April 30th to May 4th. So it hasn't been running a huge lot period of time. You can see it's not statistically significant based off of Clavio, which also actually leads me to the next point. And I want to clarify this again before we dive into the meat and potatoes, because this is super important before we even do any of this stuff. Like before we actually start implementing testing, this is where most brands and most agencies actually just get it wrong. It's right out the gate. So statistical significance, try saying that seven times in a row. It is absolutely crucial to ensure that your tests are actually statistically significant. If you're using A-B testing on Clavio, for example, it'll tell you right here if it is statistically significant. There we go. But it's also important to think for yourself here. So as an example, let's say that you want to test a campaign send time and you set up a split test on Clavio testing 8 a.m. versus 5 p.m. The sales roll in, your open rates and click rates and purchases are way higher on the 5 p.m. send time and Clavio automatically deems this as statistically significant. But it's only significant for that one test because the 5 p.m. send time outperformed in this test doesn't mean 5 p.m. is going to be 100% optimal at every time. So in order to figure that out, you need to run multiple tests across the same types of campaigns, depending on how many campaigns you're sending. That may be over the course of, you know, six to 12 different campaigns. 
just to see, hey, are we actually seeing a trend here or is this just a one-off? So beyond this, you need to make sure that you actually have a goal and a target for your test. If you don't know what you're trying to achieve, you will have no idea if you achieved it or not. That's It sounds stupid, but it is very true. So the next thing here is just diving into our actual pop-up split testing. So again here, we wanna start by testing the variable with the highest leverage. So the first thing we wanna do is determine why we're split testing and what our goal is here. So with the pop-up, why are we split testing? We wanna improve opt-in rates, right? So we're getting more subscribers into our system and our goals here are gonna be targeting an four to 8% opt-in rate. And if you're already at eight plus percent, you're already ahead of the game. You can always look at increasing that, but for most of our clients, we're gonna run into, you know, we're gonna land into the four to 8%. Sometimes it's a little bit higher than that as well. Now, this is kind of what that might look like. So with the pop-up, the variables that we've found that have the highest leverage in order are these five variables. So the offer, the pop-up behavior, sign-up forms, design tests, and copy tests. So let's dive into each one of these and I'll show you kind of the tests that we run. So with the offer, we found, like I said, that this has the biggest impact hands down. Think about it this way. If you have a million dollar house that you wanna sell and you walk up to 10 different people and you offer to sell it to them for $100,000, people are gonna find a way to come up with that money even if they don't have the money for it because it's an insanely good offer. Now, if you have the same house and you walked up to the same people, but you're asking for a million dollars, it's probably unlikely that you're going to get any one of those people to buy it. Yeah, sure, it might be market value, but it, people aren't going to jump at the chance to spend what the market value is on the thing. Uh, we want to, as Alex Ramosi says here, make an offer so good that people feel stupid saying no. But we've got e-com stores, not houses. Same thing. The offer, i.e. like the $10 off versus the 10% off. The free gift with purchase versus $10 off. The percentage off your first subscription versus a giveaway. These are all going to have the biggest impact on your opt-in rates. So offer testing here can have a huge, huge, huge difference. So we tested a surprise versus a 10% off. The 10% off did 163% better for this client. Ridiculous, right? So huge, huge, huge impact that these offers can have. And this is just one very simple example. The next thing we want to test is the pop-up behavior. So the behavior tests we typically are going to test are going to come down to timing. We'll start with timing. Timing is the first thing. We usually start out with a six second versus a 20 second delay. You don't wanna have it right away. Like you don't want this thing to just pop up and bother people immediately, but you also don't wanna delay it too long. If you do, people aren't gonna see it. You're gonna reduce the amount of people who are actually getting into your ecosystem. The next thing is scroll distance. So with scroll distance, we typically wanna test out a 20% versus a 60% scroll distance. Next is targeting. So targeting is actually really, really cool. There's tons of the different things that you can do with targeting. Oftentimes, the first thing that we're gonna test is countries. So the first thing is just either testing with including different countries or excluding different countries. And then you can actually get like really deep into this and be like, okay, let's test different offers or different designs that may resonate better with Canadian customers or US customers or Australian customers or whatever. And then looking at how you can maybe craft custom offers based off of that too, right? So for example here, like some clients have better margins in Canada versus the US, and if 10% off cuts too deep into the margins in Canada or in the US, I should say, then they might wanna try something different. They wanna have a different offer. So that's a really, really good opportunity to test different offers for different countries. If you really wanna level up, segment and then customize your language specific to the country you're targeting, right? Again, little things are going to have impacts here. This probably won't make sense for a while. Like you need to be pretty well established in order for this to actually have a meaningful impact, but it can definitely. Sign up forms. So I've been talking a lot about pop-ups and really I should actually be calling them sign up forms. So there's four different types of sign up forms that you can use specifically with Klaviyo. You got pop-ups, full page, flyouts, and embeds. Now embeds are usually at the bottom of the page. It's kind of like that thing at the very bottom where we're just trying to capture email addresses. You have very few people who actually make it there and, and submit. So we're left with three other options here. We found that pop-ups do well probably nine out of 10 times. But what we also want to do is test pop-ups that are like full page versus just normal pop-ups. So this is something I really recommend testing out too. It's testing out pop-ups versus full page forms on desktop, which takes up a ton more space. On mobile, it's like, well, you know, there's only so much space on there. So like a pop-up often is the full page. But for desktop especially, you might want to test out having a full page versus having just like that pop-up right in the middle. Have um, meaningful impacts there. Bonus here, this is kind of a sub S that you can do. 
within signup forms is testing having a teaser versus not having a teaser. Sometimes getting just like a small micro commitment right out the gate can lead to higher opt-in rates because people have already committed to saying, yes, I want that gift. And they want to remain consistent with that commitment that they made to themselves and to you, right? So this is just an example of that uh, from a program that we used to build out pop-ups uh, called Amped. So really cool platform for, for testing pop-ups and they make them beautiful too. So the fourth thing we want to test is the design. Now we want to test radically different things here. First thinking like, hey, let's test an image versus uh, no image in the pop-up. Let's test the CTA color. Let's test the call to action itself. Radically different design layouts. The goal here is just to systematically test different factors to determine the best combination, right? We don't want to change all of the things in one go because again, we won't know which variable actually had the impact. Copy test, final thing that we test here, there's usually very little copy in the pop-up and honestly, we recommend having as little copy as possible so that people do not get distracted. But this is one of the last things you can test there too. So the next piece here is uh, email split testing. So when it comes down to, and we're gonna break this down into like flows and campaigns as well, so don't worry. So when it comes down to email split testing, you wanna test the highest leverage areas first as well. And I'm gonna dive into the differences between the flows and the campaign testing in just a minute, because there are slight nuances there. The first thing you need to determine is just where is my biggest bottleneck? Uh, if you haven't watched this video yet, there's a video on my channel that walks through like biggest bottlenecks and how to identify those bottlenecks. But essentially, like, is it your open rates, your click rates, your conversion rates? If your open rates are 10% and your click rates are 0.8%, even though your click rates aren't the best, it doesn't matter. You need to focus on improving your open rates because they suck, right? <laughs> Any improvement in open rates will trickle down to getting more clicks anyway. So despite your click rate not necessarily changing, you are getting more people because if you get, you know, four times as many opens, you're going to get four times as many clicks. Not exactly number for number, but that's how the math works, right? It'll be very similar. If you increase your open rates to, like I said, if you increase your open rates to 50%, you get 400% more clicks. And this is a crucial, crucial piece with email split testing. Focus on the highest leverage and earliest stage in the funnel first, because everything trickles down. Now with flow split testing, if you've already split test your pop-up or you're actively running split tests to improve opt-in rates, the next piece is to start split testing flows. So the first thing, identify the highest leverage earliest stage that can be improved. Usually this comes down to either open rates or click rates. Conversions are, you know, a little bit of a bigger topic. So there's a lot more variables in there too. Like, you know, if you're talking conversion rates, you're talking website, offer, like product, like so many different things, right? So what are some tests that you can run to improve open rates? Well, your open rate target is going to vary by industry and by brand. Um, again, we need to have this goal in mind first. And it also depends on the flow, which may seem weird, right? But for example, the email that people receive, like the first email that people receive in the welcome series should have a much higher open rate than the second email in an abandoned cart flow, for example. People are opting in for a special offer and they should be stoked about it. They should be excited and they should go check their inbox right what you now. As a minimum, you should be targeting 35 to 40% open rates for all of your flows. Now, if you look on the internet, you're going to see a bunch of places to feel like 20% is like a good open rate, etc. Yeah, when there wasn't iOS issues, right? Now there's iOS 15. There's a lot of kind of like inflation of what the open rate actually is. So really, really important to, to take a look at that. The first email in the welcome and thank you shit series, well, both different different flows should be 50% or more. Keep that in mind. Now, how can we improve those open rates? Subject lines. Subject lines is a big one. Uh, testing two different types of angles or influence triggers. So curiosity versus direct benefit. Social proof versus scarcity. Direct offer versus question. So time delays. This can also be super, super impactful with flows like the browse abandonment and the abandoned checkout. You'll basically just want to do a conditional split for this and you'll you want to test like maybe uh, 30 minutes versus an hour versus two hours versus four hours type of thing. Now, preview text is another one. Now, preview text won't have quite as much of an impact as the subject line, but split testing in these different variables can also help to improve your open rates incrementally. So including or excluding social proof, uh, scarcity versus urgency, curiosity versus pain points, a lot of different things we can do here with preview text. Another one is sending names. So simply just testing out who the, the email is actually coming from. You can't test too many things from a legal perspective, but testing uh, sending from your own name, like if you're the founder versus testing sending as the company, right? 
And you can always change this. Like there's different times where you can use either one. Like if you want to do a more sentimental thing, you might want to send that as the founder. And bonus here. So if you're experiencing open rate issues that are far worse than normal, you may actually have a deliverability issue, not an open rate issue. If people aren't receiving your emails, in their inbox, meaning they're going to spam, obviously they can't open them. So just keep that in mind. So the things that you're gonna wanna focus on are, are those high volume flows. So the welcome series is one of the highest volume flows out there, uh, or it should be like number one or number two in terms of what is driving the most revenue from flows. So for welcome, the first thing we wanna test is the first one, right? The first email in the series. Okay, so some of the welcome tests that we can do is personalization, right? So which emails can we use this on? We can use this on emails one to six. Um, if you're collecting zero party data in your pop-up, which I would recommend doing, split test different welcome flows based off of the zero party data you're receiving. This can dramatically help to improve your welcome series conversion rates. For example, if you send sell men's, women's clothing, collect info about what customers are actually shopping for and then split test and send different content for people depending on what they're actually interested in. This actually led to a 75% increase in placed order rate on the first email alone of running this test. So you can see like this was kind of both and then we split tested this and we increased our placed order rate by 75%, which is nuts. Next piece is the benefits. So test out which benefits that you're highlighting and which benefits of the products that you're highlighting and see which ones resonate more with your customers. If you have two to three different core benefits, try creating a split test with very similar design structure, but focus on different benefits within each email. Bonus here, try collecting a zero party data in the pop-up regarding the main reason that your customers are actually shopping. If you can do this and like identify their biggest pain point or the biggest benefit that they're looking for, or the main thing that they're, the main reason they're shopping with you, this will help you understand your customers better which means you can tailor your messaging with campaigns, with flows, et cetera, accordingly, right? So this is a, a great example here. Again, this is pop-up from AMP as well. Another thing that you can test here is the offer, right? So we kind of go back to the, the, the pop-up here. If you're split testing the pop-up, one thing that you can test here is just the offer and see like how the welcome series works out depending on each one of those offers. It can be super, super worthwhile to split test those initial offers because sometimes like the opt-in rate might be higher, but the actual purchase rate might be lower. So keep an eye on that. It can be really an interesting test. It's a little bit more of an intense test, but it can be really cool. And then us versus them. So this is gonna be email two or three. This is effectively just testing, sharing a brand story versus stacking yourself up against competitors in like an us versus them style email. So you're like, I'm sure you've seen those like comparisons where it's like us and you have like all those green check marks. It's like, great, 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 great. The competitors. And then it's all the X's and you know, people aren't impressed, right? Show the pros and cons and uh, why you are better. The next one uh, is just the browse abandonment flow. Again, this is gonna be high volume. The browse abandonment flow is super, super high volume. And typically it's gonna be one of the top three to four revenue producing flows. So it's definitely worthwhile to test this one out. At this stage, people viewed your product and didn't make it any further. And this is typically because they either were not convinced about your product or not convinced about you. So we usually test the browse abandonment flow. We start it with an in, a reminder or indecision email first, followed by an email just highlighting some of the benefits and highlighting some of the best sellers that you might have. So time delay is one thing. We always do this with the browse abandonment. You can test, well, obviously you test this with the whole flow, right? The whole flow is going through a, a different time delay. Right. We almost always start with like, you know, a 30 minute, a one hour, a two hour and a four hour. And if we notice that the 30 minute is performing best, sometimes we'll take this further and split test a 15 minute versus 30 minute versus maybe like a 45 or something. Right. If you don't have a ton of monthly website traffic, i.e. if you have less than like 10,000 visitors a month, try just testing two different time delays at a time. Right. So like do a 30 minute and do a two hour. Try to be as different as possible. Right. If you're testing like 15 minutes versus 30 minutes, like, uh, like it's not a great test to start with, right? You can always refine that further as you're trying to like really dial it down, but test radically different things first. You can also test the benefits in the browse abandonment one, test out different benefits of the product and see which one resonates the most. If you have two to three core benefits, try split testing the, uh, again, like very similar designs and structure, but with a different focus on, you know, different benefits in each email. 
If you can stack up benefits with two to three reviews that speak to each one of those benefits, it's also going to go a long way because you're now leveraging social proof along with the benefits. Okay, high proximity flow. So high proximity to purchase. Abandoned checkout flow is one of them. Now, the abandoned checkout flow is super important, and there's actually a difference here between abandoned checkout and abandoned cart. If you don't know that, go check the abandoned checkout video or the abandoned cart video, either one, and I'll get into that differentiation. But usually this is going to be the number one or number two highest revenue producing flow because it's very close to purchase completion and people were obviously super high intent. People do not complete their checkout for a couple of different reasons and typically it's four or five different reasons, right? The shipping price, shipping time, product cost, or they don't trust you or they just got distracted, right? That's the last one that a lot of people forget about, but it's it's true. So that's why like in the first email, go watch that video. But that's why in the first email, we just start with like, hey, did you forget this, right? And we don't combat product costs right away because that means we're sacrificing margin right away. So first test we're going to do is uh, time delay. Again, same here, same here as the uh, browse abandonment, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, four hours. If we notice 30 minutes is performing best, sometimes we'll do a, a further split test there. Personalization. Again, this can be with all of the Vanity Checkout emails. There's two different ways that you can test out personalization with this. The first is to leverage the zero party data you obtained in the pop-up to basically just more directly agitate people's pain points or provide the benefits that they're most looking for. And the second way that is great for product or great for stores with low product SKUs, like if you know you have 70, 80, 90% of your revenue from one SKU, is just do a custom build out for those specific SKUs. So instead of receiving generic abandoned checkout series, the customer actually receives something that is specifically tailored for that product that they were about to purchase. Again, goes a long way. Personalization helps a ton. Other thing we're going to test is offers. So in the abandoned checkout four to six, typically we're going to try to solve that final objection that I mentioned, which is price. Most brands start by offering the discount. They're like, hey, you want like 15% off? We had a client who came on board and, and they were doing like, the first email was like 10% and then it was 15 and then it was 20 and then it was 30. And then it was like, dude, you just want like, we will pay you to take it <laughs> pretty much, right? Which is silly. We want to start with handling the objections that uh, could be happening, but we don't want to start with this one because it's not going to work out very well and we're going to end up in margin, right? So usually we're going to have that incentive in emails four to six, or usually it's like four and five, and then we'll test different offers here to see if we have a significant variance in results. Scarcity versus urgency. This is going to be in emails three and five. Again, in these emails, you can test out using scarcity versus using urgency. Objections. So this is going to be mostly handled in number two and three, sometimes in email four as well. Uh, depending on what you're going to have there, but usually it's going to be emails two and three. And again, people don't complete their checkout for those reasons. Leveraging those reasons and then just testing out handling people's objections can help you narrow down what's actually most important to your customers. Super important. Um, Post-purchase flows. So post-purchase is one of the best opportunities to get your customers to buy more, to spend more money with you. The best time to get people to buy more is right after they just bought from you, especially if you can give them a special offer. Leverage the excitement and aim to increase that revenue right out the gate with this flow. So again, offers you can test in post-purchase one and two will often have a cross-sell or an upsell. In either one of these cases, it can be beneficial to just test out different offers to see what works the best. Products, different products that we're testing for post-purchase upsell or cross-sell. If you've got just a few SKUs, this can be a great opportunity to test out different products as a upsell or cross-sell just to see what works best. Right. Especially if you're, you know, it's supplements or, you know, a food or and that kind of related thing. It can be really, really cool to split test those different SKUs. I mean, clothing works really well too, right? You're pairing up different items. Uh, if you've got a lot of different SKUs though, I'd recommend testing dynamic product recommendations as well. Okay. So campaigns, when it comes to campaigns, the same three stages in the email marketing funnel exist, right? Your open rates, your click rates, your conversion rates. And again, here, you should have a purpose behind your testing. You don't just want to test to test, figure out which one of these stages will have the biggest impact if improved and then go there. So let's dive into each one of those and see what might be happening at those stages if you have a bottleneck there. So open rates. As some very, very, very general KPIs with your campaigns, you should be shooting for about 30% plus open rates. Ideally, we're actually searching for around 40%, but higher doesn't always mean better. So if you're consistently getting 60% open rates, for example, I would recommend actually expanding your segment. So if you're using like a 90 day engage, try using 120 or try using 180. If you're having the opposite problem though, 
the first thing you want to check is deliverability. Deliverability is like a whole thing on its own. It's an absolute beast. And there's a video on that. And I actually go through the entire SOP. Just so just refer to that if you do have any questions, but this is crucial. It's super, super important. If you don't properly diagnose your open rate issue, you're just going to end up wasting a ton of time. It's not your subject lines that suck. Then like just fix the thing that sucks right now. Right? So. Uh, segments. So if your open rates are low, but your deliverability is great, this is usually the number one culprit for low open rates. Batching and blasting, i.e. not segmenting at all. This means that every single person on your list receives the exact same email. Not good. No personalization. People are just a number. People do not want to feel like a number. They want to feel like they're getting highly personalized emails straight to their inbox. Things they're actually interested in. By doing some list cleaning, i.e. getting rid of unengaged people and sending relevant content to the right people at the right time with like with the right message, um, you're bound to improve your open rates. This means excluding people from certain campaigns and also including others and being intentional about who you're sending to and what you're sending to those people. If you want a full breakdown on this, another beast, this is like a 34 minute video. I think it's the one that's highlighted right now on my channel. Go check that out. It's an absolute beast. Now, one thing we do test initially uh, and also intermittently for clients uh, is including like a wide range of segments in one email and then looking at the audience breakdown tab within Klaviyo to understand more about each audience. So what segments are most engaged? who's opening the most, who's clicking the most, who's purchasing the most, um, and what segments might be having just like a net zero impact on their performance. This is kind of what it looks like. The larger segments will usually mean lower open rates. Smaller segments usually mean higher open rates if you're doing this right. So the list of segments here, you can see, you know, we've got our 30 day engaged, uh, we've got our 60 day engaged, 60 day engaged leads, 60 day engaged purchases. So we just broke this down into like leads, purchases, and then people who are considered all in there. And then we're looking at 30 and 60 days. So you can see that there's a variance here between the place order rate. You can see that there's a variance here with the open rate, a click rate, and then the revenue. So just looking at that and understanding like, okay, where's the actual impact coming from? Super important. Okay, so subject lines. Subject lines will typically have the largest impact on open rates beyond segmentation and deliverability. Here's the thing though. It's important to consider what your consumer is going to think when they actually open the email. We call this maintaining ad scent, right? So if someone clicks on an email with a subject line that says five ways to decrease acne and they open it and it's an email promoting a sale with absolutely zero mention of those five tips, no bueno. When people read subject lines and decide to open your email, what they receive on the inside should not be a surprise. It shouldn't be like, oh, wow, like exactly what I was expecting. Different from curiosity. Some of the subject line tests that we run is going to be like a pain point versus a benefit, a urgency versus scarcity, a curiosity versus social proof. There's a ton of different things that you can test out here, but they will all have varying levels of impact. Preview text, very similar to subject lines here. We just don't want surprises and you can leverage the same types of tests. Sender name, same thing as what I mentioned before, either sending as the company or the individual to the founder, uh, send time. So this can actually have a huge impact on open rates, click rates, and conversion rates. So part of the process with email marketing is just making sure that you're sending people the right message at the right time. Consider when people are most likely to be opening their emails, when they're most likely to want to shop, and then also when they're most likely to convert. So if you're selling to moms, this is going to be different than if you're selling to business owners. And try testing out radically different things and just make sure that you actually have statistical significance here. And also make sure that things aren't being skewed because of a few purchases. Look at the purchases and the placed order rate versus the placed order amount, right? Technically, this is an open rate test because we're looking at, okay, if we're testing send times, it's going to be like, are people opening that message at, at the right time? Are more people opening, et cetera? But it's also really important to consider this. So what we also want to make sure is that our open rates, if we have higher open rates, if we have higher click rates, is that actually coinciding with the best purchase rates? So they did below, but that's not always the case. You can see here we have like open rates that are higher here, click rates that are higher here. Our placed order rate is higher as well, but they don't always do that. And then it's the same thing here, right? Uh, higher open rates, higher click rates, higher purchase rates. Again, it's not always the case. And it's really important to look at that and be like, okay, well, 
yeah, our open rates are higher, but our purchase rates are lower. Just keep that in mind. It's really important. The second to last thing here is just click rates. So if you're having a click problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 opens and a click eight one. Seriously, if you've made it this far and that didn't make you laugh, I'm sorry. But if you're not getting at least a 1% click rate on the campaigns you're sending, it means that you're sending to an audience that just isn't very engaged. You're sending content that isn't very engaging or both. No bueno in either one of those situations. More clicks means more people are going to your website and more often than not, you see higher click rates on your promotional campaigns than you will with non-promotional campaigns, right? This is normal, don't freak out. Now, if you're getting low click rates on your campaigns, here's some of the variables that you can test. First thing is segments. If your open rates are high, but your click rates are low, you may just be not super engaging to those that specific segment. So segmentation helps to ensure that people are receiving the right content that they're actually interested in. Think about it. Like if you're a guy and you get an email from a brand you just subscribe to, and the first thing you get is a email with mostly women's clothing in it, you're not going to be stoked, right? You're going to be like, what the hell is this? This isn't what I want. I mean, it's 2024. Like who knows? Like maybe, maybe you do, but like chances are you're probably not interested in that. This is why segmentation is so important. Another example we use all the time is if you sell 12 different kinds of soup and someone just purchased your Tuscan tomato soup, for example, do you think that they want to receive an email talking about how great the Tuscan tomato soup is? Probably not. One of three things is true. Either they just received their order and they love it and they need a reminder email, not an email highlighting how great the soup is. Number two, they received their order and they don't love it, which sucks. And this is just going to be salt in the wound. Or number three, they have not received their order yet. In any one of these situations, they should not receive another email about you talking about how great your soup is, right? Again, if you want more information here on segmentation, it is a beast. Go ahead, check that video out. It is a long video, but it is hella worth it. So this is kind of, again, like diving into that a little bit more, just looking at, are there any issues here? You know, or where's our bounce rate coming from? Where's our open rate coming from? Where's our best click rate coming from? Place to order rate coming from, etc. right? So the header, the header is the first thing that people see when they open the email. That's why it's one of the most powerful pieces of the puzzle. A few elements that we're gonna test is like an offer forward header versus a benefit forward header versus pain point forward headers or a brand forward header. And so there's a ton of different kind of like focuses you can have in this header. The image selection can also play a major role in email performance. So we should never just add an image to add an image. It's important to consider and be thoughtful about what images you're adding in and why. Right. Some tests you might want to run here would be benefits focused images, pain point focused images, images with or without models, GIFs versus images, GIFs, GIFs, I don't know what, images with text versus images without text, all of these things, but make sure they're radically different. Now there's hundreds of tests that you can do here with email design, but one of the most common tests that we run is one of the ones that is most different. So we often test out beautiful design heavy images uh, or design heavy emails, I should say versus plain text emails. And what we found is that plain text emails do a great job of popping out in the inbox because they're more personalized. They feel more personalized, especially when it's framed as like a letter from a founder or like a quick note or a reminder or a quick message. Um, a few times where we found these emails particularly helpful is big promotions. Like if you have like a more sentimental holiday, uh, product launches or flash sales. There's a lot of different kind of opportunities there. So again, this is actually one of the text only emails that we send. So you can see the open rate is bananas, the click rate is solid, and then our placed order rate is great as well. Now, when it comes to CTAs, without a clear CTA, your email has no purchase, but with too many CTAs, your email struggles to have a clear purpose. The goal is to have one CTA and one call to action you would like subscribers to take. That doesn't mean you just have one button for the CTA, it just means you have one action you want them to take. And so we usually recommend having like two or three of those, but it means that you should be focusing on driving people to take one action, not 67 different actions. Our CTAs may include like, and the tests that we do for our CTAs may include testing CTA colors, testing the actual CTA. So like shop now versus get relief, that type of thing. There's a lot of different tests we can do there too. Now, body copy. So when it comes to body copy, this is one of the lowest impact things that we usually test, to be honest. If the other pieces of puzzle are not in place and properly optimized, people probably won't even read this. So make sure the other things are set up first, but here's a few tests that you can run with your body copy. Uh, point form versus longer form, benefit versus pain point, story versus being straight to the point, 
couple of different things that you can test there but if you're getting this far i would honestly still recommend like circle back to the other things see if we can improve other steps in the process because that'll take a long time final thing is send time so same notes with testing send times with flows okay so send times here pretty much the same notes here um just test radically different send times the final thing is conversion rates so if you've made it this far you're doing really well uh, good job this is a long video and it's super important but if you've made it this far, conversion rates are a completely different beast. And the reason for that is because once people click out of your email, there's a wide variety of different things that could be happening. People going to your website, people bouncing from your website, there's an issue on the website, the checkout page, the product isn't available, the seasonality, like there's a whole variety of different things, right? And, and seasonality is actually a big one too, right? Uh, we actually are just having that issue with a client where they're kind of freaking out and it's like, well, your conversion rate is down 30%, 40% you can only do so much, right? But they're, they're selling products that are typically consumed in the winter, in the summer, right? And it's just natural, like soup, for example, right? Like people are gonna buy soup as much in the summer as they are in the winter. We're trying to reframe that slightly, but still the majority of people are gonna be buying soup in the winter versus the summer. And you can see that with Google Trends as well. Anyways, I digress. There's a whole nother SOP and a whole nother training on conversion rates and optimizing those conversion rates as well. But hopefully this video helped and if you did, like it i'd invite you to like and subscribe and if you do have an e-com brand and you don't want to do all of this yourself and you're doing over fifty thousand dollars a month in revenue i'd invite you to apply to work with us and there's a link just below this video and you can apply there we'll have a call and if all goes well we'll jump into a full comprehensive audit for you see where there's some opportunities and then take it from there so hopefully this video helped you out and uh thanks so much for watching chat soon